Welcome to another episode of the Wellby Show and Podcast. I am very excited to have Seamus Mullen with me today. Chef and wellness pioneer and activist, I think, based on a pretty incredible and grueling health recovery from rheumatoid arthritis, which he will tell us about today. So without further ado, please um, share everything that you went through from start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, everything. Where should we start? Should well, we start, start in the womb? <laughs> no, I'd say, you know, like when you started to um, realize you were sick and yeah. experiencing symptoms. Well, it's funny. I mean, I say that jokingly, but actually I, I was when I was really, really sick. Um, I, I started seeing, I was very fortunate. I met Dr. Frank Lipman practices functional medicine. And one of the things that he asked me is like, I want to know your, your health history. Tell me your medical story. And so I said, well, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis like eight years ago. And he said, no, 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 no. I want to, I want to know everything. Tell me your earliest memories of ever getting sick. Um, and what was curious about that is that he actually was able to eventually connect all these dots throughout the whole course of my life that led to a critical moment when I actually got to the point of being in the hospital and diagnosed with RA. And I often, when I talk to other people who are living with autoimmune dysfunction, uh, particularly people that are quite new to it, we have this, this real fixation on causation and wanting to know, okay, if we can identify what is the trigger, what's the cause, what's the thing that caused this illness? And then we can go in and like plug that hole, we can fix everything. And the reality is that the, the body is a system and there's so many different areas that that can slowly erode that system. And, and then wherever the weakest point is, that's where the body breaks down. Um, and, uh, and for a lot of people with autoimmune dysfunction, that starts in the gut. Um, so for me, I, I didn't really realize that for a very long time, I was slowly getting sick. But my, you know, it's sort of like, as it, it, it's, it's like you suddenly look outside and, and the sun is set and it's dark. We didn't realize how that happened, just kind of slowly that transition. I was slowly going from being relatively healthy to being quite sick. Um, and when it is this kind of very uh, slow, insidious march towards il illness, you don't really realize um, that your new normal is constantly changing. Um, so I, I was a, I, I've been a professional chef my whole life, and I, I was cooking um, in the professional kitchen, which is not an easy place to work. Um, everybody's seen reality TV shows, you know that it's 90 hour week, work weeks, and, and uh, chefs are prone to screaming and, and quite a stressful environment. And I just started feeling crappy in my late 20s, and I, I just wrote it off to being part and parcel of being a chef. Um, but eventually, it became clear that there was something severely wrong with my body. Um, I started getting really bad uh, acute attacks in my right shoulder. I also just felt like crap all the time. I just felt like I was exhausted. My body felt swollen and sore. Um, I had headaches all the time. And then I started getting these acute attacks where my I wouldn't be able to even move my arm. It, it was so painful. It felt like somebody was like stabbing me in the, in the shoulder. And uh, I didn't know what to do because I had kind of, you know, as guys were conditioned to just put your head down and, you know, pretend it's fine. And you show it. If you admit that you don't feel well, it's a sign of weakness. And so I just tried to like soldier through it. But it got to the point where I really had to, obviously there's a major problem. And I, I started going to the ER. I didn't know what else to do. And... Um, They'd x-ray my shoulder and say, ask if I'd had an injury, which I hadn't. And then they'd send me home with painkillers. And that was that. And that happened time and time again until it started going over to my other shoulder. And that's when I was like, there's something wrong here. It's going on in both shoulders. And it happened in my hip. And when it happened in my hip, that's when um, I was I was admitted to the hospital. And I ended up being, uh, I was in the hospital for like 10 days, I think. And I was under observation. So, so much pain. I couldn't, I mean, I could barely speak. I was in, in so much pain. And... Uh, they finally did an MRI of my hip and saw that it was full of fluid. So the pain was from my sciatic nerve being stretched from all the fluid in the hip. Um, and they thought I had an infection, which I didn't. Um, uh, and so eventually uh, they sent an email to all departments within the hospital to see if there was anyone who could understand why I would have so much, you know, such a high white blood cell count, so much fluid in my hip with no infection. And that's when the chair of rheumatology came back and diagnosed me with rheumatoid arthritis. So that was my diagnosis story, and that's kind of where the story begins. But yeah, that's yeah. That was uh, I was in my early thirties. So since you mentioned the womb, of course, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about that. And um, were there, you know, I know some people talk about gut trouble coming from like mm -hmm. a, a C-section, perhaps, right. or not being breastfed, or things like that. Were, were any of these things kind no. of part of it? No, or? I was a natural vaginal birth. Uh, I was breastfed. 
But I did, um, what I, I know now in hindsight, looking back is that, um, a lot of the foods that we ate growing up were considered health foods at the time. Um, really were quite inflammatory for me. Like I, I didn't feel very well afterwards. Like I, I was constantly bloated after every meal. Um, I was exhausted, I had headaches. And then I started developing a lot of, um, a lot of just infections. I'd get strep throat all the time. Um, so I was put on antibiotics quite frequently from an early age. So I, th I think that for me, the beginning um, of it was, and there was probably some, a genetic component to, to a degree as well. I and mean, maybe not a hugely gen huge genetic component. My grandmother, uh, I suspect had RA as well. Okay. But uh, I think more than anything, it was just that I, I was gluten sensitive, definitely sensitive to legumes. And those were two things that were really, you know, big in, in our family when I was growing up dairy as well. So we ate a lot of dairy, a lot of legumes and a lot of gluten. And I would feel pretty crappy after eating. Um, and then that coupled with that kind of led to eroding my immune system to lots of, uh, you know, lots of infections that led to more antibiotics. And then, and then as I got older, I started having like more serious infections. I got salmonella when I was in, in, in high school and then I got um, parasites later. So I think all of those things kind of combined with then the stress of, of the work life that I was experiencing was like a perfect storm that eventually my immune system just started going bonkers. We've only filmed one other RA story, Welby, mm -hmm. but she had a very stressful work situation or, or life um, experience as well, and also had put on a lot of weight from it. Mm -hmm. And it was like that combination of this, this like mm -hmm. stressful trigger and then the weight and then the, it just exploded into RA. But I don't know if that was also part of like restaurant life. I'm sure yeah. it's like a little unhealthy and therefore you, oh, yeah. you know, probably Food, eat and overeat drugs, and drugs yeah. and partying too much alcohol and staying up really late and not, not looking after the, after the body. And eventually it's, it's all doable when you're 23 years old, but um, you know, you'll pay the price 10 years later. So tell me sort of what post-diagnosis pre Frank Lipman <laughs> transpired. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of like a, a, a uh, slow and steady decline after that. Um, when I was diagnosed, I had no idea what RA was. I didn't know there was a difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. I didn't even know what autoimmune dysfunction was. I mean, it was, these were all very new things to me. And I certainly thought that arthritis was uh, a disease of the elderly, not of somebody in their early thirties. Um, but I, you know, I, I kind of, I went down the conventional path of, uh, of, of, Western medicine. And to a degree, I, I was, I was very relieved to get a diagnosis because now it kind of made sense of the fact that I felt like, didn't felt like crap all the time. The downside of it was that I also put so much trust and faith in the medical community as they, you know, they said, listen, it's, you're going to have this disease for the rest of your life, but they're great meds. We can manage the disease. You're going to be okay, but you're going to be on these meds for the rest of your life. And there was a, a part of that that I was like, Hmm. I'm not sure I'm okay with that. But then there was another part of me that was also like, well, I guess that's just the, you know, the hand I was dealt and I'm going to deal with it. Um, and what I didn't know, and then I started to realize over the course of the next several years is that the actual meds that I was on were, were leaving me exposed to infection and they were deteriorating my health even more than just, they were basically just suppressing the, the symptoms and we're doing absolutely nothing to address what the root cause was. So that that in, ter in turn also created another layer of stress as well. Um, so I went from, you know, having acute flare-ups frequently to no longer having as many acute flare-ups, but just being in a constant state of chronic inflammation and illness, um, and and also being very vulnerable to infection. In fact, I almost died from bacterial meningitis. Um, because I was not able, my immune system wasn't able to, to suppress, to, to combat it. Um, and when I came out of that, that's when I realized I got to change. I mean, I can't continue to, to live my life the way I'm leading it. And that's, that's when I met Frank Lipman. Um, so that was a real turning point for me. You know, meeting him was incredible. Working with him over the next couple of years was amazing, but I didn't see any progress for at least six months. So it was, um, you know, it was, it was not an easy road. Having also, you know, worked with a functional or integrative medicine practitioner trying to solve a health issue. I remember her saying, if you do this program and all the components of it, which is a lot, it's a whole lifestyle yeah. change for six months. Like mine was a 
amenorrhea situation, which is like a loss of menstrual cycle, she said, you know, it'll come back. Mm -hmm. And six months and a day later it did. But I yeah. remember like month four or five being oh like, gosh, is this woman yeah, like a yeah. total quack? Like yeah. I've been doing all the things, you know, like can mm -hmm. I start to let up a little bit, you know? And then when it, when it all, you know, kind of worked out, I was like, oh no, six months is, you know, it's a slower road, but it's mm -hmm. obviously longer lasting in its impact because you actually begin to heal the totally. body. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. If I hadn't had Frank there as a cheerleader saying, you're gonna feel better, I would have, you know, I would have quit. And you know, there's no way, I would, after like two months of saying, I, I don't feel any better, like, what's the point? At least if I go out and eat a pint of ice cream and drink a bottle of wine, I feel good, you know, for a little while, for a minute. Yeah. Um, instead, you know, doing doing everything right and still feeling terrible, um, it's pretty hard to have the discipline to, to, to stick to it. And it really does require um, having a team. I mean, that's why I was really fortunate to have, there, there are so many important people in my life that helped me get through that period of my life. Um, but definitely Frank was, was there giving me as a coach, just saying, trust me, you're gonna feel better. You're gonna feel better. You're gonna feel better. It's gonna take, it's gonna take time, but you will feel better. And that was something that the sort of the, the, the allopathic world had never really said to me. They never were willing to, put their reputation on the line and say, you're going to feel better. It was more like, we'll try this drug. And if that doesn't work, then we'll try this drug. And if that doesn't work, we'll try this drug. And, then and also like, yeah. we can't promise anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then if that doesn't work when all else fails, you know, you'll try this and your body will get used to it and then we'll try this. And then eventually maybe you'll get into a clinical trial. And that's sort of like the, that's the, that's the, the trajectory. And it's not really, obviously that's not, that's not a recipe for, for, um, for rectifying your, your, your health crisis. So what was sort of the craziest thing that you heard pre- diagnosis about what might be going on. I mean, one of the things that I was told right away is that I would probably be in a wheelchair by the time I was 45. Um, I'm 45. <laughs> I'm not in a wheelchair. As a uh, chef, I'm sure that was like... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought that I was going to lose use, use of my hands, that they would be disfigured, I wouldn't be able to hold a knife. And, uh, and that really like everything that my livelihood was going to be stripped away from me. Um, and that there wasn't really anything I could do about it. That there, in all likelihood, I would have to have multiple surgeries and have joint fusions in my hands and in my feet and all these things. So I was kind of bracing myself for that. So what actually brought you to the functional medicine world and Dr. Frank Lipman? Because it is not, I mean, and this sounds like it was a few years ago at least mm -hmm. um, that you first saw him. And it's much more popular now yeah. and much more accepted. But certainly when I was, you know, younger and going through my own health issues, it was very much like those are quacks yeah. and like these are real doctors. And yeah. so how did you both, you know, emotionally and culturally bridge that gap? I mean, it seems like you were sort of at like, I'll try anything. Yeah, I was at the like, I'll try anything. But at the same time, I was also half assing it. Like, I'll try anything, but I'm not really going to not really going to do it. And um, in a weird way, I mean, Frank found me. We were introduced to each other um, through a mutual friend, and I didn't even tell him anything about what was going on with me. And he just took one look at me and he knew that I was not well. And he's like, and he literally said, what the F is going on with you? And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. I'm good. He said, no, no, there's something wrong with you. What is going on? And he could see the inflammation in my face. He could see the pain. He could see the anger that I was holding on to for experiencing pain. And he badgered me. He was like, I want you to come to my office. I want you to see me. Like, I, okay, uh, all right, I don't want to see another doctor, but fine. And it just everything about his his approach was so different from anything I experienced before, where there was genuine care and concern. He really wanted to see his patients get better. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, I felt just like I had an ally in him in a way that I hadn't felt before. Um, and... Uh, and then I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give this a try since this guy is so nice and willing to work with me. But I wasn't like I was at, I mean, I was at, I was at my, my end. I've said this before, but this is like a, there's a great Buddhist teaching that says when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And um, I think I had to get to that rock bottom and bounce off rock bottom. And there was Frank to kind of catch me as I bounced off, the, uh, off of rock bottom and then kind of get me on my feet and help me go from there. Once he started working with you, I mean, it seems like you are mostly um, diet was the biggest thing for you. Di yeah, there, there. Were, I mean, diet was a big thing. Par the parasites was a big thing too, um, and and that was probably one of the key components in in leaky gut syndrome. So, um, uh, so clearing up the parasites. I went to see a parasitologist and went through like treatment for parasites, um, and then changing the diet, supplementation. We used actually did use some antibiotics as well, very low level antibiotics. 
Um, but the idea was to try to, you know, get the gut back into a healthy balance. And, um, and then from there, just, I mean, that's when exercise became really important, lifestyle changes, yoga practice, moderating my stress as best as I could. It sounds a little woo-woo, but we do know that stress is literally one of the key drivers in, in autoimmune dysfunction. And it's a very difficult thing to quantify. You know, we're all stressed. I mean, look, I was just driving through New York City today. That's stressful. Like there's so many things that create, uh, I, I think of them as like the paper cuts of life. So if you have to, sometimes you have to really take an assessment and step back and say, how can I become immune to these paper cuts or at least defend against them? Because they are slowly eroding your ability to, to uh, maintain a state of homeostasis. As a founder and entrepreneur, I've been thinking a lot about stress and mm -hmm. how you handle things and I've realized it's really not about having the stressors in your life, but rather how you handle just them. deal with them and handle mm -hmm. them as they come up and how certain things really can kick yeah. a low health, chronic health problem into an autoimmune mm -hmm. condition. I've seen it you know, happen over yeah. and over, but that certainly doesn't mean it can't be reversed if you can yeah. figure out how to you know, deal with those stressors as they come up. And I think it's very cool that that was part of the healing process for you. It wasn't just diet or just supplements or, you know, yeah. so, some of the knocks on functional integrative health is that certain practitioners and doctors just throw the kitchen sink of mm -hmm. herbs and yeah. stuff at you. And you have to take all these, you know, collagen and this mm -hmm. and that. It, it can be quite overwhelming, but bringing it back to like, no, that's one piece of it. You've also got to, yeah. you know, There's work on this. Yeah, I think there's a we we have some we do something that I call transactional health or transactional medicine, which is this idea that if you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a pill, you've done your job. You know, okay, I don't feel well. I go to the doctor. Doctor gives me a pill. I go home. I go back on my day. I go through my my daily business. And um, and if you take that model and you just apply it to integrative medicine, it's no better than than the allopathic um, process because it's all you're doing is you're swapping the medicine for the so-called superfood or for the supplement or whatever it is. And it's not about understanding that there are so many different factors that impact our body's ability to be healthy or that impact our body's ability to defend against pathogens um, or to defend against itself. The supplementation can be a piece of it, but throwing, as you said, throwing the kitchen sink and everything is not, and plenty of people will not do well with a lot of those supplements as well. Um, you know, it's not like, Bulletproof coffee is an, is a panacea for everyone because I know plenty of people that drink bulletproof coffee and then they go and crap their pants. I mean, it's not like it's good for everyone. So yeah. I think it's really important to understand that you have to look at look at the the, the entire picture and and lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, stress management is, is super important. Yeah. So you mentioned parasites, which is a really interesting thing that I'm not sure enough people talk about because it seems to be present in a lot of situations mm -hmm. with. Yeah. autoimmunity um, or just you know obviously gut problems and and brain problems as well mm -hmm. now that we understand so much about the gut yeah, brain connection probably. why isn't the the understanding of fungus and parasites and these sorts of things like more present in you know not just conventional but all kinds of of you know medicine because it, it it feels like like you said you could you can put a lot on top of that but yeah. if you've never gotten rid of this thing that's using you as a host mm -hmm. unlikely you're really gonna care of those chronic health right. issues, right? Yeah. How can you get control of your gut when that's in there? Yeah, it's tough because it's not, parasites are not something that they're, you can't easily test for parasites. Um, and many, many people, I mean, I don't remember what the stats are, but something like 30% of Americans actually have parasites. I could be wrong on that number, but some, some outrageously high number mm -hmm. of people are walking around with parasites and they have no idea. And most of them are probably not even that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, if you, whether it's from food or from 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 water, somehow end up with a, a significant colony of parasites in your gut, and you can have it for a long period of time. They obviously are producing bacteria as well, which can be inflammatory. It can they can deteriorate the the integrity of the gut lining um, over time, and it's not something that that it's it's so subtle that um, I think a lot of uh, conventional doctors have not have kind of. With, you know, if it's making you violently ill, then obviously there's a, there's, it's like, oh, this is a huge problem. Let's get rid of it. But when it's something that's really slow and subtle and chronic like that, it's very difficult to say, um, okay, this is, this could be part of the problem. And usually I think that's an important um, distinction to make that it's not the problem. It's part of the problem. 
because that usually ends up leading to other things that lead to greater deterioration of the gut. So take me through where you were first mm -hmm. seeing Frank and just, you know, physically and what you were doing for work mm -hmm. and just the whole experience of finally getting to the end of that six months. And, you know, what, how were you, how did you know you were getting better? Was it, you know, a lack of pain? Was it, you know, just what, what, what happened? It, well, when I first started working Frank, it was, um, as I said before, I was really angry. Um, I was very much, woe is me. You know, I've got this horrible disease. I didn't deserve this. Why is this going on? And so there's a lot of, um, of the victim blame game where I was just taking the responsibility off myself and saying, it's not my fault. This has happened to me. And I had to kind of reframe um, my perspective on well-being and on my own health. I had to stop thinking of myself as a sick person. And that was a major, major cataclysmic shift for me. I started thinking of myself as somebody who was dealing with a sickness, but I wasn't a sick person. And there's a, a, there's a distinction there. Um, and I had to start to let go of some of the anger and take some of the responsibility. Uh, the good news is once I started to feel a little bit better, that responsibility, um, I also could be proud of it. And I could share in the, in the spoils of it. I was like, oh, I'm feeling better because of the work I'm doing, not because of some pill I'm taking. So what's the obvious thing you're going to do? Do more of the work. Right. Because it's going to make you feel, you know, you take a pill and you feel a little bit, a little bit better. You're not like, I'm going to take more pills now. You, you, you're like, okay, this worked. I'll take what I need to take. Um, but if you actually are starting to, to see the fruits of your labor, um, there's a, there's, there's a real empowerment that comes along with that. Um, but it took a long time. You know, I, I kept going back to Frank and saying, I don't know, I'm not feeling any better. I still feel like crap. In fact, I feel worse now. And, um, and he kept saying, trust me, you're going to feel better. It's going to take six months. You're going to feel better. It's going to take six months. And just like you, six months in the day, I woke up, I got out of bed, started walking down the stairs and suddenly realized, wait a second, I'm not walking down the stairs one step at a time. And and I took another step and I was like, well, wait a second, my feet aren't swollen. And it was the first time in probably 11 years that I'd gotten out of bed without my feet killing me. Like it used to be sometimes even just to touch the floor was like somebody hit my foot with a hammer. So I'd have to like put my legs over the bed and then sit there for 10 minutes and then kind of get up and I'd walk like an old man. I could barely move um, until I had been moving for like an hour and a half in the morning. Um, but I was, I was like walking down the stairs like a normal person. And suddenly I realized it was like this eureka moment. I was like, oh my God, this is what it feels like not to feel pain. I had become so accustomed to just feeling pain that that was my normal. And uh, I needed to reframe that to a new normal that was a non-pain normal. Um, and and that, was, that was a remarkable moment. And I, I walked down the stairs and the first thing I did, I, I was like super excited. I, I used to be a cyclist. I had been a cyclist when I was younger and I hadn't ridden my bike in years. So I... I took my bike and pumped up the tires and I went for a bike ride and rode like maybe six miles. But, um, you know, that was incredible. And I was so happy just to be on the bicycle and to be moving. And it felt good to be moving. And the next day I did it again. And then I rode 12 miles and then 20 miles and then 40 miles. And like within three months, I was, I had worked up to 80 miles, you know, 80 mile bike rides to believe that I was never going to ride a bicycle again to then being able to ride like 80 miles. It was a huge, huge accomplishment. Besides a wheelchair, like, would you be working now? Would you be do, able to do anything that you're doing now if you'd kind of stayed on the path you were on? Or have you been able to ever talk to some of those mm -hmm. doctors and say like, look at me now, you know, like maybe you should tell your other patients to pursue yeah. this road? No, I, or... I mean, it's funny, I actually just got an email two, a couple of days ago from, from one of my doctors. He was like, I've been following you and so happy to see that you're doing so well. And he was just like, I'm, I'm really interested in what, you know, what your approach has been. And I, I'd love to integrate more of that into how we're treating patients. Changes afoot, and um, and also with the younger generation of, of, of the medical community, they're going the path of conventional medicine, <clears throat> but with a very open mind. And they're seeing that, you know, there's there's countless anecdotal stories, anecdotal evidence of of people reversing and certainly preventing autoimmune dysfunction. I mean, that's that's one that we don't even really talk about, but that that a healthy lifestyle can can keep you healthy. And, you know, we talk a lot about we, we, the notion of healthcare is really sick care, sick care in this country. It's not something we don't really focus on, on staying healthy when we're healthy. You know, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who's like mm -hmm. one of the yeah. 
you know, they call him one of the founding fathers, whatever that means, mm-hmm. of functional medicine. Yeah, yeah. But I had a quote on my Instagram a couple months ago or weeks ago about him just saying, prevention is fluffy. Like mm-hmm. we have to measure, we can measure disease and recovery, but we're not measuring and we can't seem to me- measure in the current system preventing this stuff yeah. and how much money and time and illness and life can be avoided, I mean, yeah. can be avoided yeah. and, and is being saved. And until we do that, this will always just be seen as like a little bit fluffy stuff, yeah. this, this lifestyle yeah. diet stuff. Um, because of course, when you can save somebody's life in an ER, like that dramatic. just seems yeah. so much more valuable and dramatic and your yeah. services are worth more than somebody teaching you how to not be a victim or yeah. to, you know, remove gluten and let your gut heal. So where are you today and with your health and just also, you know, what are you up to? Mm-hmm. Um, as far as I know, you, you know, obviously you're a trained chef, but mm-hmm. what, what, you know, how, how is that in your life now? I'm great. My health is really good. Um, uh, I, I feel very fortunate. No drugs? No, no, no drugs. No, no I haven't been on, on any drugs for eight years. Um, no, uh, no, um, all my inflammatory markers, my biomarkers are, are negative, normal and negative um, for RA. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I, I think like if you were to consider the conventional uh, diagnosis process for RA, you'd say that I'm in remission. When I think of it, I don't think of myself as being in remission. I was out of balance and my immune system reacted through this presentation of symptoms that we classify as rheumatoid arthritis. But realistically, they're not that different from the symptoms that go along with Crohn's or that go along with MS or that go along with countless other autoimmune dysfunctions. So it's easy for us to silo them into the group of, of symptoms and say that that's what, this, that's what this disease is because it also makes it easier for the pharmaceutical industry to funnel drugs specifically to that disease. Um, there's a lot of money in people being sick. Um, Restless leg syndrome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how can yeah. you, you have to put a, a label on oh, everything. How about, how about my favorite? OIC, opioid induced constipation. So, oh my God, I, yeah. I hadn't so, even heard of that. I know, one. exactly. So, there's a new medicine so you can take because the one medicine makes you constipated. There's new medicine specifically for constipation caused by the medicine that you're taking, which we call medicine and react reality that they're just poisons. I mean, you know. Um, even so, fibromyalgia is just, you know, was, a blanket was, term yeah, for it's, joint it's pain. A, yeah, it's a yeah. garbage pill. I mean, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, Sjogren syndrome, on and on and on. So, where am I today? Uh, well, uh, I'm healthy. I'm doing well. You know, I, I, I don't cook professionally in a restaurant any longer. Um, I, uh, I do a lot of consulting. I do a lot of, uh, of media work. Um, and I try to, as much as I can, share my story and other stories like my story so that, that, that um, folks who are in similar paths that I was in uh, can hopefully glean a little bit of, of, of hope more than anything. I and mean, I think that the, the content of what I have to share is, is important, but what's much more important is the context, the understanding that it is entirely possible to take control and autonomy over your well-being, but you have to be focused and you have to make it a priority. And, um, and, and if you do that, you will see results. I mean, I always say that like the, the food is a, is a zero risk approach to treating illness. There's no downside to having a positive relationship with food, to having a healthy relationship with food. And there is no illness that will not benefit from a healthy diet. Um, and that's what I think is, a, is something that, that everyone can take away. And as a chef, I'm, it's important to me that that food tastes really good and that you're inspired to eat it and that it involves community because that's another thing that we don't focus on enough is the importance of our community, the community that we create and food is at the center of that. So that actually leads me to a question I had for you, which is I did an elimination diet in January because Mm -hmm. I have a thyroid uh, condition and um, the stress of my business actually kicked Mm -hmm. it into Hashimoto's, which is amazing how that happens. Writing my first book was like one of the most unhealthy things I ever did. (laughs) Right. And of course, I, you know, dealt with this low level hypothyroidism for like over a decade. There was more support and community. And Mm -hmm. I think when you go out and try to do something on your own, you feel a lack of support and that's what mm-hmm. really created this um you know autoimmune response to my body but eating out or the lack of being able to eat out in new york city for mm-hmm. a month was really kind of sad and yeah. i realized how much a part of it is unfortunately we're not doing a lot of home hosting and cooking anymore um a lot Certainly of people not, not in cities as much yeah. not to the extent that you know i think 
civilizations did even a hundred years ago. I mean, that was normal and eating out at a restaurant was mm -hmm. like a really rare occasion. Experiencing, you know, fun with like my husband or my friends, or whatever, that mm -hmm. was always around, always around food, but always around, you know, restaurants, yep. unfortunately. And I was, you know, trying to make it work and going to these places and asking them what, you know, cooking mm -hmm. oils they were using and this and that. And it was like almost impossible, except yeah. at a handful of places. You know this restaurant world very well. Yeah. How do you make it either healthier for people or bring the the home cooking environment and hosting environment back into the culture? And yeah. you know, what do we do? Because it, it is really, really challenging to keep on a, a autoimmune, you know, restriction kind of diet yeah. um, and still eat in restaurants. I think that um, it really depends on where you are in your journey. Uh, you know, I, when I was really in the thick of it and I, um, I was very, very conscientious about everything that went into my body. Um, as I got a little bit better and my, my health was more stable then I was like, oh, you know, can I have a little bit of dairy every once in a while? Sure. See how I feel. Um, can I have a bite of some really good bread and see how I feel? And I, I generally speaking, I didn't feel like an acute response necessarily. Um, but as long as I wasn't doing it all the time. So I was sort of following the 80, 20 rule. Um, but it's really tough because nearly every restaurant uses canola oil and nearly every restaurant, you know, uses all sorts of ingredients. You don't necessarily know the quality of the produce, the, the, the protein, where it's coming from. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's why I think it certainly is, it's hard at the beginning, but if you can, you know, try to as best as you can to be, um, to, to, to cook at home and control your food environment as best you can. And then as you start to feel better and you start to make progress, maybe you can, you can start to dabble and find finding like those restaurants where that you can trust where they're allies, where if you ask them, can I just, is there any way that I have this cooked in olive oil or can I have, you know, I mean, I, I come from the restaurant world. I owned restaurants for years. And I, I think a lot of times people are really scared to modify dishes in the restaurant. Oftentimes you'll see a lot of menus say we politely decline any modifications, things like that. And that's fine. Like if that's their shtick, then I'm just not going to go to that restaurant. You know, that's right. that, and I totally get it. But um, as, as a as a as a diner, you're going out, you're paying money to have an experience. And if and generally speaking, the people that are in the world of hospitality, they're in that world because they want to make you feel good. Um, they really derive pleasure from hosting people and cooking for people. It's certainly why I became a chef because I love cooking for other people. So, I mean, I can tell you that most restaurants would be more than happy to make modifications. And I do it. I modify things in restaurants all the time. And I try to be as gracious as I can. Like, I'm so sorry to be a pain in the ass, but is there any way that you could do that without potatoes? And maybe I could get some steamed greens on the side or something like that. And, and Or maybe I'll just go back in the kitchen and cook them for you. <laughs> but generally speaking, I find that restaurants are really, really accommodating. Yeah, I did have one meal, I'll give them a shout out, at Foragers, you know, on mm -hmm. 22nd sure. and 8th um, during that time. And mm -hmm. they couldn't have been nicer. And like even as I would finished the you know nightmare that was ordering there, yeah. they came back and said, wait, actually that one thing that you ordered, we forgot, that's actually cooked in butter. Like, is that okay? Yeah. And I said, actually, no, thank you. Like, is there uh, any way to do it without or whatever? And I was able to switch something around. Mm -hmm. But the fact that even, I mean, because I wouldn't have known, you right. know, at that point. Right, but um, it might not have felt so well, and you would have been like, "Well, I guess I just can't eat there." Right, but yeah. the, he was like so concerned to make sure that if I was, you know, making these other alterations, mm -hmm. that I could, you know, get what I needed, and they had like such high quality grass fed, you know, mm -hmm. meat and stuff like that. But I mean, there were very few restaurants in the city of restaurants mm -hmm. um, that I think had even the basics of what they yeah. had, at, or were willing to do all of that for me. So it almost made it like not pleasurable anymore because yeah. I'm watching, you know, the friends that we're with and they're just kind of like rolling their eyes and it's and you, and forever. You yeah. And you don't want to be like the, the, the person that's like, Oh, and I can't have that. And I can't have that. And I can't have this. And yeah. yeah. Right. They're like, well, why are you even eating out? Yeah. I'm like, cause I want to hang out with you guys. Yeah, exactly. But you know, that's what it, what it all comes back to as you were talking about is yeah. really, it's all about food being the center of this greater need for community. Um, well, then maybe part of the elimination diet needs to be also eliminating the people that are not supportive. Right, who are rolling their eyes yeah, at you? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I really want to ask you about the restaurant stuff because I think um, the more people say like, oh, you know, it's really important that I don't have canola oil. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, um, does that fryer use something with gluten or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things. Yeah. I hope it starts to make restaurateurs, you know, not 
people have had to go through what you went through slowly make these changes? Or do you yeah. think that's not real? No, I think it's, I mean, I think some of the changes are happening and there certainly are plenty of restaurants now that are following better food protocols um, uh, and making changes in, within, you know, how they operate. It's getting rid of canola oil. I mean, it's difficult because it's near, it's such a cheap and plentiful oil. Um, and it's also difficult, I think, for the diner to recognize that there's a, also a cost associated with using better quality ingredients because it's the margins are so small in the restaurant world. And let's say you're using excellent quality grass-fed beef. It's going to be very expensive, yeah. which means you're going to pay a premium for that. And I think that's the way it should be, too. You should also pay a premium for it, appreciate it, and not eat it all the time. Unfortunately, we live in a, in, in a world that our, in the United States, we um, spend less per capita on uh, food than any other, or disposable income on food than any other um, nation in the developed world. We just don't put premium on food because we're so used to cheap food being readily available. We think, we're conditioned to think that food should be cheap. And that's part of the, the health crisis that we're in is that for 50 years, more than that now, for like 60 years since the end of World War II, with huge government subsidies going into, into industrial agriculture, we've brought the price of meat and, and vegetables down so low that we're conditioned to think that we should, that everything should be cheap. And in reality, um, really good ingredients, really good food, it requires a tremendous amount of resources to grow, to produce, to package, to, to ship. There's gonna be a cost associated with it. I heard a, a woman at the farmer's market a few years ago, uh, a farmer, and she said, I overheard her, and she said, you know, you can either pay your farmer today or your doctor tomorrow, the choice is yours. We deprioritize really good quality food because there's so many other things that we want to be spending our money on. Yeah, pretty sure I read, you know, a hundred years ago, about eighty percent of your, you know, disposable, uh, disposable income. income yeah. was spent on food, food and it's six percent today yeah. for Americans, which is just and, and it's blows not just your mind. Not, not just your food, but also time. So hundred years ago, someone in the family spent a hundred percent of her time thinking about food, and then fifty years ago, someone spent. 40% of her time. And now we spend almost none of our time thinking about food because food just appears. It's like, oh yeah, we need to order some food. What do we do? Or, oh yeah, I'm at the grocery store and I'm at the checkout and there's some food, food-like product right there. So we don't really think about how we used to consider food so, so much more than we do. It was, a, you know, as we evolved as humans, it was one of the only things we needed. Um, and, and so we spent, and if you look at most other animals, they spend their entire lives either eating sleeping or having sex and that's it they're concerned with food throughout their the entirety of their their conscious um, time and we aren't we've kind of de um sensitized ourselves from that relationship with food because it's just it's ever present um in these really you know toxic food-like substances there's a direct correlation between the foods that we eat and how our body behaves so besides food we do something for all of our well-be interviews, especially with people who have had um, mm -hmm. these health recoveries um, through integrative or functional medicine, and it's the you know, How I Get Well-Be series. And these are your like can't miss, not your like occasional things, but mm -hmm. like if a day goes by that I don't do these, you know, one, two, or three things, like I know I'm gonna maybe send myself back into a place I don't want to go. I get well-be by exercising every day, cycling, uh, hiking yoga, lifting weights, um, kettlebells. I do a lot of stuff with kettlebells. Um, yeah, I mean, anything just to move my body. Sometimes, I mean, I've been, the past four days I've been doing construction, so that's been like lifting. I mean, it's just been physical labor, but to me that's still exercise. Like that's using my body as, my, as nature intended my body to be used. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for my sharing pleasure. everything thanks, that you went through, me. everything that you're doing now. Um, I think it's, an inspiration always to hear these stories of what people, you know, came from and their mm -hmm. rock bottom and how they were able to recover um, for the well-be audience. But especially, we don't have a lot of guys talking about it, and I think it's it's awesome because, you know, women are just known to be sharers. I yeah. think, um, and like you said, it's sort of this like staple of masculinity. Oh, I'm like we don't we cover up when we're in pain when we're going through stuff. We should yeah. soldier on, um, and for you to not only take the time to find somebody, or I guess Frank found you, you found me, yeah. but who could uh, <laughs> turn that around for you and then also say like, well, this is something I kind of need 
other people to know mm -hmm. because it's not like there aren't other men out there with RA. No, there's plenty or of men. Or, or of, any other issue. I mean, lots of issues. Yeah. yeah. We were conditioned from a very young age not to be vulnerable because to show vulnerability is to show weakness. And to show weakness means that on the playground, you're going to get the crap kicked out of you. So we need to change the way that we are teaching our boys to become men so they can understand that. If there's if there's something if they're not feeling well or their health is not well, it's not manly to pretend you don't feel well. It's manly to fix the problem, and to get healthy so that you can be a provider, so that you can be a strong man. Um, because it's too easy to just to to say no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. The next minute, you know, you keel over and die of a heart attack. You know, usually the number one symptom of a heart attack is a heart attack. As guys, we wait until we fall over or suddenly we have cancer or whatever it might be. So we don't really understand that, like see these warning signs that life is presenting us with and how do we process that information? Do we ignore it? Do we put it under the under the, the bed and pretend that we don't have all this clutter or do you organize it, take care of it and address the problem head on? And I think women are much better at that and hopefully men can get better at that. That's awesome. I was also just going to say not just death, but self the self-medicating that comes yeah. with pain or just you know shoving stuff under mm -hmm. the bed with today's age especially the opioids and the mm -hmm. alcohol and everything else like that's i think also being weak sure. right so it's oh, like yeah. a, i mean any any addiction is usually just a band-aid for for trauma it's the brave courageous thing to do actually to 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 hit that head mm -hmm. on and kind of get to the root of that pain or whatever might be behind it that would make you i think want to medicate or eventually you know, have a heart attack. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Thank you for inspiring others to do that. And thanks for sharing your story again.